So I'll show you how MATLAB can be used to do some of these computations. So one thing to keep in mind is that you need to be connected to the VPN in order to run this if you are off campus, if you're using the license in, in that provide by the university. If you use your own copy, then that's fine. So you launch MATLAB, and what happens here is you have a bunch of buttons. I won't get into those buttons because I actually don't use them. I use all command line. And the, th the first thing that you see is this prompt here, right? It's almost like the terminal window of MSDOS back in the days. And what's going to happen is that, and this might be a little bit slightly different than yours because I move things around, but you can probably relate to this as you walk through with your version. And it's going to start in a particular folder. So let's say we actually create a, a folder there for what we're going to do here at CMPA8 Lecture 2. So I create that folder, and then I'll switch to that folder. And now everything that I create is going to be stored right there. The one thing that you want to know right away is how to call for help. So that's as simple as typing help. When you type help, you get a bunch of things. And let me just walk you through this, because um, and I might be getting more than probably you get because of the version I have and maybe different. But let me just show you some of the simple. So you type help and this happens. It says help topics. You have a number of things. This will allow you to figure out how to find help for certain themes. And the thing that I would like to, us to focus is in the following. MATLAB demos. I will not be able to do this for us because we run out of time, but this is a place where you can actually, if you type help demos, you can actually find a lot of demos that you can actually run and see what MATLAB can do for us. Okay? But let's get a little bit simpler. Let's say I would like to check that inequality, that equality of the cosine, right? So I need the cosine function. I'm very practical. I don't want to read the help files. I'm, but I'll, I'll give you more of a crash course of this. But let me just say this is very intuitive. So I'm going to say help COS, which is how I write cosine in the quiz. right? And this is going to give me information about the cosine. So what does it say? It says cosine of the argument in radians. Okay. Basically, it says you need to call it as cosine parenthesis, whatever angle in radians you want to compute the cosine of parenthesis. Okay? Make sense? It gives you also inside of other functions that you may want to explore. What do you think A cos is? So the inverse of cosine. And cos D? Potentially cosine in degrees. So you can either click or type help a cosine. This is a little bit mysterious. I usually don't emphasize it too much, but this is saying that there are many functions called cosine. The default one is going to be the one that you see right here, but if you force it, or if you run the function cosine with a particular argument, it might pick some of this. In particular, this GPU array is to do parallel computing. So if you're running a parallel algorithm, it will actually use the parallelized cosine. And the last one, if you're actually running a symbolic computation of cosine, is going to use the symbolic version of cosine. Okay? But for now, you can pretty much not worry about that. But what I can actually do suggest is that you go into this link, because this is where we learn more, actually. So you click there. And this is going to take you to the reading reader version of this function. And again, this is for all functions, and I'm going to just do it for the cosine. So as you see here in the context, there are all the functions that MATLAB has. I'll scroll in a minute. But what you can see here is almost like a web page. Actually, this is what is at mathworks.com. 
it explains what the function is. It says it returns the cosine for each element of x. You can actually pass a vector to get the cosine of the elements of that vector. But more interestingly, it gives you some examples. Like for instance here, and then you copy this and paste it in the workspace, and then you generate the same result. But let me just tell you what this is doing. What this is doing is plotting cosine. And we could actually do this to validate what you did for the sine function using sine. I'm going to plot it between minus pi and pi. And here is the value of the cosine. And it sounds, looks reasonable, right? The way you run that is by, the, by doing plot in the x-axis I want the variable determining angles in radians. And in the y-axis, I would like the function cosine of that horizontal. Okay. The point is that I need to define what the value of x is. So I could run this in a for loop, which we'll see shortly, for many values between minus pi and pi. But MATLAB, because it's very user-friendly, it tells you that um, you can define that grid very simply as a vector x that goes from minus pi to pi at increments of 0 0.01 radians. So when I run this, what do you think is going to happen? Do I get a vector? I get a matrix or a vector, right? with one column or one row, we'll figure that out, going from minus pi to minus pi plus 0 0.01, minus pi, minus pi plus 0 0.01 plus 0 0.01, and all the way to pi. Will be a bunch of entries there. And then this plot function graphs that object, which I hope is a vector. graphs the cosine of that vector, applies the cosine to the vector and computes the cosine of each element and puts it on another vector. And then it comes here and it plots minus pi with cosine of minus pi, which is minus 1, minus pi plus 0 0.01 cosine of that, and put it there. And then a bunch of points, you get a bunch of points. But the plot command is going to interpolate all those things. It's going to give you a line between two points. You can actually decide what you want to do with that interpolation if you want to be very precise. And then you see what happens. You get a smooth curve out of a bunch of points. Make sense? Questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, so is it a so let's do it so I'm gonna grab this I'm gonna copy this and then I'm gonna go here I'm gonna clear and I'm going to paste it okay so far nothing has happened And that's the result. OK? To answer your question, let's play with this plot a little bit. So this is computed and put on the screen. Now, I'm going to get into this line and grab it. And I'm going to do right click on it. And then I'm going to check line style to none. Oops. Before I do that, I should probably put a marker, marker, that, and then line style to none. So now there is no line to line. And now if I zoom in with the magnifier, see what I see? This is what I was telling you. So it generates two vectors 
and then it just runs a plot command by sweeping through the vectors. So entry one of x, entry one of cosine of x, two vectors, put a point. Keep doing this over and over, and then based on what instructions you give it to connect these lines, it's going to connect them. Make sense? It's not real time. OK. So what did we generate here? Again, we are just playing with this. Well, we generate a vector. So what do we have in the workspace in this environment? If you type who, it will tell you you have one variable, x. What is x? x should be a vector. OK, so now I can go plot x comma x, what should that give me? A line from minus pi to pi, from minus pi to pi. I could check the first entry of x, looks pretty good, minus pi. I can check the second entry of x, it should be minus pi plus 0 0.01 and so on. How many entries do I have? I can check the size of that. What do I have? What do you think this means? Intuition says I have 629 points or 629 entries in the vector x. Is this a row vector or a column vector? Row vector, right? This is n, this is m. Yeah? Make sense? Yeah? Okay. So that's my, again, my crash course on doing these things. So let's take a little bit more of a introductory um, work of this. Let's say we have the need to enter a number. So I'm going to enter this number 12.4 and the answer is 12.4. Right? Let's say I want to multiply this by 2. So I put 12.4. I don't even need the space but I just put it to be clear. Start 2. The answer is twice that. Let's say I want to do a division. The answer is that. Let's say I want to do a power. That symbol is the power. Exactly how you do in your calculator. Okay. Let's say I want to do a square root. Well, I need to know how to do the square root. So my question is, how do I find what the square root is? My simple suggestion is to go to the file, the, the help, and then MATLAB, search documentation, the square root. SQR, the square root, MATLAB. MATLAB is the core software, the command line I'm working with. The other things are add-ons. What are these add-ons for? If you want to use MATLAB to do signal processing, then you can use this signal processing toolbox. What is this? It's a bunch of libraries that have signal processing functions. If you want to do what is called a Fourier decomposition, if you want to filter, you don't need to code it yourself, you just run these functions, like any library for software. If you want to do DSP, if you want to do control, these are the toolboxes that are, some of these are added when you get the more expensive version of the student version of MATLAB and might be useful to you. But you just keep an eye on this one, right? MATLAB. So you say, well, the square root sounds familiar. If I want to compute the square root, then this is the function. Yes, this is it. Okay, let's see. The square root of minus 2, 2, mm, sounds kind of familiar. What is that going on there? Is this a vector going on? Let's look at the um, 
documents. Well, that's as much as we have. Tips. A square root m is a square root of uh, of a matrix. This didn't give me as much information as I was expecting, but now I can go here and I say a square root of two, which should be what we expect. So any simple operation that you want to probably run in this course, there is a function for it. Okay? With me? Questions? Any... Is this right? Is that right? Are you, are you concerned a little bit about what is it miss? What is missing? A lot of numbers, right? Actually, we know that these guys have infinitely many numbers. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. You do these computations and then you run. It looks like. However, this is the display of the number, but under the hood. If I were to do something with the square root of 2 times pi, it would multiply a lot of the decimals. And that's just a representation of the result. There is a precision that is behind the hood that is being used, and it's pretty high. And you can actually configure that as you want. So let's say I want to do something more complicated, like what we have here in the, in the reader. 12.4 times 48.5 plus 342 divided by 39. The comment here is that the same separation of operations that you use when you write down things will be respected by MATLAB. The reason I put a parenthesis here and a parenthesis here is because I want to multiply this whole thing by this number. Okay? And this division here will only divide 342. It will not divide the sum of these two numbers. If I want to do that, I need to put parenthesis between this sum. Okay? It will parse it the same way that it will parse any other that you will parse any other operation on paper. But then you can find weird things, like for instance, 2 divided by 2 divided by 2. That's not a date. That's a division. Does the result make sense? Yeah? So what it did, even though the parsing is not obvious, it divide 2 by 2, give you 1, and then divide that by 2. Okay. My suggestion is not to write these things because you're going to get confused. Is to do this, even though it's somewhat redundant. That's a better way to write it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the output of these um, computations is always given by ANS. You see that that variable keeps coming up. ANS, ANS, ANS. Actually, once you compute something, ANS is the latest result. So you can actually use it for the next calculation if you want. <coughs> Make sense? OK. These are just operations with numbers. Again, instead of grabbing my calculator, I can grab MATLAB and do this thing. And I can do this with vectors. Clear? The next level of complexity that I like to show you is using variables. Why are variables useful when we code? Because when you want to change something later on, you don't have to keep going back and change all the numbers. Absolutely. You just put them somewhere at the beginning of your code. You write your code with the generic variables letters typically or words and then any change on the variable values will give you the new result okay so how do we define variables in matlab what would you do if i want to define a variable a to be equal to one 
a equal to 1. This is me a. What if I want to define b equal to 3? I just do that. If I don't want to have this output here because it's kind of taking a space, I can use the semicolon. And that's going to stop the output from happening. But this operation occurred. So it saves some space. When you run a script many times and you define variables, either you will get all this out or you can put this and you can hide it. Okay? And now I can do things like C equal A plus B. And I like to see the result to make sure we're on the right page. Or I can do D equal C plus D to the A. And then I have a problem. What happened here? It it's an implicit thing. But I like these things, right? I like implicit. I like equations. Let's go to a simpler one. Let's go to D equal C plus D. It still would not do it for me. Can I solve for these things? Yeah, right? You can solve it. You move D to the other side, and D will be... Anything. Yes? Because when you move it to the other side, it says D equal to... Sorry, D minus D equal to C. And that goes away. Yeah? Meaning that C should be zero. Did I define C as zero? No. So how do we solve the equations? I mean, we can do all computations with, um, with variables and do all these things we do with numbers. But let's get something interesting. So solve equations. So that's my help. Solve equations. OK. And here's where I like to get to ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. Remember that? OK. So solve equations. I want to solve equations. Solve. OK, that's not accept. I'm going to skip that. So equation variables. Good. I'll skip some of these, and I will go two examples and I'm going to jump to this one because I'm ambitious so I like to solve the question I told you about on Thursday ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero. Okay. The way that MATLAB tells me to solve this, because these are to some extent complex um, equations, is by defining symbols. Okay, so I define symbols A, B, C, and X. And then I'm going to skip, I'm going to just solve this one here. Solve equals solve of ax squared plus bx plus c. What is the answer? It's going to solve for x as a function of a, b, and c. And this is what I mentioned yesterday, in the first one. Minus b plus minus, which with this minus will go inside and it will give me the two roots. The square root of b squared minus 4ac, all that divided by 2a. Okay, so let's do this. Clear all will pretty much make my workspace fresh. And now I'm going to do that. I'm going to remove 
that. It's a little busy, but that's my answer. Okay? It's pretty smart because he didn't ask me is A positive or B or C or whatever, any sign or anything. Since I use X here, it assumed that X was the variable I want to solve for. Does that make sense? And since sol is my solution and I want to read this a little bit better, this is what I can do. I can make it look pretty. If you find math pretty. And this is what you probably remember. <coughs> minus b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a. And then minus b minus the same thing. So now let's say I have, I have a particular polynomial. Let's say I have something with a. So first, first of all, let's make sure that we store what the solution was. So yes, we have the solution there. And then any time I do show that solution, it will give me that. Okay. So now I want to know the value of these roots for a particular polynomial. So then let's say I'm going to look at a equal 1, b, b equal 0, and c equal minus 2. So that's the polynomial is x squared minus c equal to 0. And now I'm going to find out the numbers that solve that polynomial. One way you can do that is by doing evaluation. So eval of the solution will give me the roots. Okay, again, a equal one makes x squared, b equals zero kills the second term, minus, what did I say? Two, right? Minus two. So x squared minus two equal to zero, how do you solve that? You move the minus two to the right, x squared equal to two, You Put the square root on the other, the, the power 2 on the other side, you get a square root of 2. What is the square root of 2? 1.41 and so on. But remember, because when you have a number a square equal to something, that number can be positive or negative because the square kills the sign. So you get the two roots. Okay? So you can use these to solve a slightly more intricate. Um, expressions. Questions? Um, higher up, you use the, the Kiwi Sims. Uh, yes. Right here. So I would like to solve for the roots of this polynomial, no matter what a, b, and c are. So I tell MATLAB, treat a, b, and c in the following expression as symbols. Uh, I haven't said whether a is equal to 1, b is equal to 0, and c is equal to minus 2 yet. So in many cases, in many of the problems we're going to solve in this class, you can do this symbolically. If you have a 10 order polynomial here, this is not going to go much further. It's going to say, sorry, I can't find the solution. Again, MATLAB is not giving you answers to everything. Okay? The solution is what we expect. We put it in some sort of a nice visual way. And then we make sure we say that. And then we evaluated this solution. How do we do that? We define what A would like to have, what B would like to have, and what C would like to have, and then we evaluate. Now we can change our mind. We can say, well, actually I want A equal to 2, B equal to 1, and C equal to 2, whatever. And then I'm going to evaluate this solution. And that's the answer. So you have a symbolic solution that you can evaluate at any variable that you like. Okay. Make sense? 
Anything weird in the answer? I. What does that mean? Imaginary, right? In some literature is J. In this is I. This means that these two are complex numbers with real part minus one quarter and imaginary part equal to plus minus these numbers, okay? Remember how you can describe a complex number on the plane? X-axis you put the real and imaginary axis you put imaginary y-axis so this will be a point in the, the, the top one will be a point on the third quadrant yeah and this other point will be a point on the second quadrant we will not use many imaginary numbers but eventually you probably need them for some other courses but expect imaginary numbers from polynomials as roots any other questions Right, so, so what, what happens now, right? So I set the map. The object SOL, Sol, who is in the workspace, this guy is still symbolic. But these guys now became numbers. Does that make sense? The internals are a little bit different. They use different memory allocations for symbolic and specific numbers. And sometimes you need to be a little bit careful about the sequence you do things, right? Because if I were to solve the equation with solve command with the specific numbers, I will kill the symbolic part of solve, right? Does that make sense? I don't want to run it, otherwise I confuse people. But if you run again the solve command, it will give you an answer that is evaluated and it's done. So if you just type in sim abc, will it change it back to the sim? Let's try it. Again, we can experiment with all these things. And Friday, you guys have the first lab that you can actually play with this a lot. And then who, and then evolve. So it went back to being symbolic. OK. This is the answer to the command. Every time I run a command in MATLAB, okay, there's an answer. And that answer is stored by default on a variable that is called ANS. Yeah, I understand that. Before, when we asked who our variable were, it just said A, B, C, S, O, L, and X. Now okay. it's added the ANS. Yeah. So this is the who, right? Yeah. So this is telling me what variables I have in my workspace. So every time you run something, it will generate this ANS into the workspace. Okay, every time I run something, it will generate that, add it to the workspace. So you have it. Okay, so because we didn't ask it to give us an answer yet, the first time we asked who it was, then it's okay. Correct. It keeps adding these things into the workspace. And actually, there is a way that you can save the workspace. Actually, that's a good point. So. If I, do, if I do a lot of work that I want to say and then come back tomorrow and resume, I don't need to type everything again. What I can do is to save the workspace, and that's going to generate in here, let's say, um, solve workspace. And it's going to save it as an MAT file. MAT files is a data file that saves all the data in the workspace. So if I now go and do clear all, or I come back tomorrow, there will be nothing in my workspace, okay? No variables. But now I can load that particular workspace. And now I have everything back, okay? But I use the tab command to pop up, populate my command. But you can do 
kind of go here and say um, import data and it will allow you to pick this MAT. I tried to use the command line and I recommend it because it's a little faster. But yeah, you can uh, do load and actually you can do um, ls. It will list all the files like in good old Linux. Uh, maybe there will work too, yeah, if you do the OS. Or you can just go and look at your documents, MATLAB, CMP8. You can say, okay, that's the name, and then you, you'll you find ways to, to get the data. That's hopefully, it's, it's, it's like any other program you might use. Okay, so let's, um, good so far? Okay, so the things that you can remember, let's recap a little bit. Um, uh, CLC to clear screen, yeah. Clear all to clear the workspace. LS to list what you have in the current folder cd to navigate around folders i'm going to get into cmp if you do tab here it's going to pretty much populate the only option or give you many options if you have more great i'm going to clear this okay again don't forget this is all recorded so you can watch it at your leisure don't need to take a lot of notes now i would like to do help so i would like to do help on sign there is my help. I would like to do help on solve. That's a simpler version of the help we looked at before. Actually, have a lot of more examples here. So you always go to the top. The font is large here, so that's why. And then you can solve equations and then. But again, if you don't know what the name of this function is, if you just want to do something, you go here to the help and then type it here. Okay. Let's say we're interested in inverse trigonometric functions. So inverse trigonometric, great. So trigonometric functions, maybe that sounds pretty good. And that's a list of trigonometric functions. If you need to use any of this. And you can also do web. You can just type how do I use or what is the arc cosine function in MATLAB and very likely you get an answer. The next thing I want to do is vectors. So we did numbers, we did a scalar or real values, variables. And now I like to do vectors. So the way you introduce vectors is by using brackets, commas, and or semicolons. So let's say I'm going to introduce a, a second order or second dimension vector that I'm going to call little x. Before, if it was a number, I would put just a number, right? Now I need to put between brackets the vector and let's say I want it to be a column vector and I want it to be just the one vector that means what you expect is the column vector one one this semicolon tells me I will start a new row okay. so now I can get into a three-dimensional vector, and so on, okay? If I want to do it to be a row vector, instead of using the semicolon, I will use the comma. So I will do one, one, and that will give me a row vector. And if I wanted to make it three-dimensional, 
I could even skip the commas. I can actually just write a sequence of numbers and that will give me the same result. Okay? But to tell the computer that you need to start a new line, you need to put a semicolon. Or you can actually, if you were to do this on a script, which I'll hope to get to otherwise on Thursday, you'll start a new line on the script. Okay? Does this make sense? Okay. I mentioned before the size, and the size is very important because if you want to multiply matrices and vectors, there's something you need to be careful about, right? What is that you need to be careful when you multiply a vector A or a matrix A with a vector B? What should match? The number of rows and columns, right? So maybe we should do this here. Just to refresh. So if I have, um, so for the multiplication, A times B, to make sense, dimensions should match. So knowing the dimensions of these objects is very important. Let's say that this A belongs to N by M. And this belongs to P times Q. And let's make it, since we are here, let's make it both capital, because it could be two matrices. What should the relationship between these N, M, P, and Q dimensions be? So let me give you a little hint. Think about A as a matrix, so we're going to write it like this, which has here has n rows, and here has n columns. So this is my A. And I think about B as being a matrix that has P rows and Q columns. What is that we need? So what is that what is the condition we need between these numbers? So and it could be like n by m and n by q. M by q. Maybe. Sounds close. Um, m has to equal to p and m has to equal to q. So you're saying m has to be equal to p? No, to q. M Yes, no? Let's try again. Uh, I think it is n has equal to q and m is equal to p. Okay, so side homework. Let's take a to be 1, 2, 3, and 4. And let's take b to be. Five, six. What is the product A times B? Well, is one, two, three, four times five, six equal to remember. You grab these two and you multiply them by these two. So you do one times five 
plus 2 times 6. And that's what you get there. And then you do these two times these two. Which will be, so 12 plus 5, 17. 3 times 5 is 15. 4 times 6, 24 plus 15, 39. So first thing is that if I only have one row here, how do I multiply this 1, 2 by 1 number? Can't. Okay. If I have only one column here, if I want to multiply this 1 times this 2, I can't either. So the rule is that the columns of the left should match the rows of the right. And the resulting object has dimension equal to the row of the left and the column of the right. So this is all you need. Okay. This will be scanned and available online. Let's try to finish in five minutes. So let me switch to the laptop. And now we can get vectors. So I will do define and validate my matrix one, two, three, four. Okay, that's my matrix. And then my other matrix, which is just a column vector, five, six. And then I will multiply A times B. Now, MATLAB will figure out that these are multiplication between matrices and vectors. And we did the right computation. That's the answer. And the multiplication worked out because I have the right dimensions. Okay. So why this worked out? Because the size of A and the size of B were compatible. This number and this number are the same. What is the result of size? Is the dimension of the object. If the object is a vector, one of the elements in the result will be 1. In this case, this is a column vector of two entries, two rows. If the object is a matrix, then you get the number of rows first and the number of columns later. Make sense? Okay. If I make a mistake and I come and say, okay, my A is fine, but now I make B equal to 1, 3, 4, what do you think MATLAB is going to do? In and matrix dimensions must agree. Okay? So I will warn you. <coughs> When you, have, when you define a vector of a matrix, you might want to sometimes look at each of the components of the vector or the matrix. One way to do that is if you know the size, let's say, of B. OK, I have a, a row vector of three dimensions. I know that I can go and say, what is B of 1, the first element? What is B of 2? the second element, and what is B of 3? And those are the entries, because you might want to make operations using the entries. 
Make sense? Um, I have a question about comment on the code. Is the comment or the symbol for comment for making comments yes. on the number side? It is it is a percentage, actually. Thank you. We'll get to scripts where you will have comments on Thursday sounds. Yeah. But that's the comment symbol. The matrix A has four entries, right? So how do you think I can pick one of the entries? What would you write here in to do list? Let's say I want to pick the one one entry. One comma one. That'll give me that. Remember A? One, two, three, four. If I want to have the four, it will be A two two. Correct? Great. Now if I come and say A two three there is no entry. That's the kind of error you get when you sweep on entries that do not exist. Okay? We'll get used to those errors as we move along. You can do calculations with, with vectors as we do with just numbers. So as we did before, this is B. Now I can compute the cosine of B. Remember what this is going to do? Take B1, compute cosine, take B2, compute cosine, and so on, and put on a vector. There it goes. Okay. I can generate a vector C, which is, let's say, 1, 3, 4 as well, and then I can add B and C which is no more than 2 times b. What it's going to do? It's going to take b1, c1, add, put here. b2, c2, add, put there, and so on. Okay. Yeah. OK. If I were to do this, what do you think is going to happen? Error, right? I'm adding a matrix, a vector to a matrix, which has wrong dimensions. But if I were to define a matrix D that is minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, then I do A plus D, and it works. But it gives me the difference between the entries of A and the entries, main entries of D. Okay? And this calls to what is called the zero matrix. Okay? It turns out that MATLAB has a function to generate zero matrices. Zeros two by two. That will generate the matrix of zero entries. What about the matrix of ones? Yeah? What about the so-called identity matrix? What is identity matrix? Is just ones on the diagonal? Ones on the diagonal. So that's called I. And you just pick the dimension because it's going to be, by default, a square matrix. But if you want to have it non-square, you can actually put N and N. And that's the identity matrix. Okay? So I think this is a good place to stop. We didn't cover plots, but you saw plots. You just do help plot, and you can experiment with that, how to generate that. <coughs>